Well, the thing that uh, scares me about being a pastor is that God's truth is, is always beyond me. Every single Sunday, I'm bringing these beautiful truths and I'm calling us to a high standard, but it's not like I'm <coughs> up on some mountaintop calling down, hey guys, it's, uh, it's just beautiful things that the Lord is showing us. And together we're saying we're going to go to that mountaintop because it's better up there than uh, down where all the smog and the, and the, and the dirt is. And, and so we hear this high calling. We want to respond. So the, that's scary because the message is always greater than the messenger, which thank God for that, right? If you go, uh, this is my little beef against self-help gurus on television. They've got all the slick words and they've got no Holy Spirit. And if you go to a self-help guru, all he can do is call you up to the standard of another fallen human being. We're being called beyond the messenger because the message is from on high. And so uh, that's incidentally what I also love about it. The message is beyond me. That's what I fear, and that's what I am so thankful for. The message, again, today, once again, is beautiful truth. It's high truth. It's wonderful. It's so much beyond any of us, and that's a good thing. Because it calls us beyond uh, messed up humanity. It calls us beyond our messed up selves to something that's so much higher and, and so much more noble than we find in our own hearts. That's a good thing. I don't want to be the standard of my life. I determine what's right for my life because there's nothing to aspire to. I'm just stuck being Dan. But I've got a message that challenges me to my core, calls me to, to repent calls me to hear this music from heaven. It's a message that's so much better and more noble and, and more beautiful than myself, and that can always be calling me up and up and up, and I, I really, really love that. So I hope today that all of us are here and we're ready and willing to hear from the Holy Spirit because it doesn't master, matter what the pastor says. If, uh, if we're not uh, clicking with the Holy Spirit, if we're not open to what God has for us, we're just not going to listen. But if we are there's always going to be something we can grab a hold of. There's always going to be something we can take home and uh, allow God to ennoble our spirits and to call us uh, higher. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 20. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 20. Last week we had the, uh, the fellow who had the workers and he called in more workers and called in more workers. Finally in the evening he called in more workers and at the end of the day he paid them all the same. And uh, he said, it's my vineyard, I can do what I want. And that was a parable for God saying, listen, your blessing was to be able to serve in my vineyard all day. And I'm going to give everybody heaven who comes to me, whether it's late in their life or early in their life, because nobody deserves it anyways. And so he's giving this blessing equally to all the workers. People worked really hard for it get no more than the people who came in at the last moment because, again, none of us deserve heaven anyways. And my joy, my privilege is to be able to work in the vineyard right now. And I think the more we have the heart of Christ, the more thankful we are to say, yeah, Lord, thank you for not calling me at the last moment of my life. Thank you that I get to live for you right here, right now. <clears throat> and then he closes with saying, so the first will be last. Uh, so the last will be first and the first will be last. Now Jesus goes on to predict his death. Remember, this whole story arc here began with the apostles going to Jesus, trying to figure out who can be great. And so he takes some children in here, and he, he's going through all this. He talks about forgiveness. He's talking about uh, uh, church discipline. Uh, and then he talks that, listen, nobody gets more than anybody else. And then he says, and listen, I, the master, I'm going to die. So listen to this. Now Jesus was going up to Jerusalem. On the way, he took the twelve aside and said to them, we are going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. On the third day, he will be raised to life. And there's a couple things we see here. First off, Jews are Jews, right? Jews are Jews. And Gentiles are everybody else. <clears throat> Throughout history, there have been people that are, we call them anti-Semitic uh, there are the people who have been anti-Jew, and what they say is, well, the Jews killed Jesus. Well, look at this. Right here in the Bible, there's no room to judge any one people group because we have the Jews and we have 
everybody else, and they're both responsible for Christ's crucifixion. The Jews may have turned him over and sought Christ's death, but the Gentiles mocked him and flogged him and nailed him to a cross. And the truth is, theologically, theologically, if you were the only person on earth, Christ would have loved you enough that he would have died for your sin. So in a very real sense, all of our sin is responsible for the cross. There is no room uh, for that type of racist thought uh, in, in the Christian heart or in the Christian mind. It's just not in Scripture. It is not in Scripture. It's an ungodly idea. And I get very upset when people pretend to be Christians and they, they use it as a disguise for their racism. Uh, the other thing we see here is Jesus is not a helpless victim in the tide of history. You ever turn on the History Channel and have them say that? You're like, oh, brother, come off it. Jesus was just swept along, and there were bigger forces than him, and, and the Jewish people wanted to be free, and the Roman Empire was trying to hold him down, and he's just kind of going in the tide, and he can't help himself. No, Jesus knew before it happened. He knew it was going to happen in Jerusalem, and he went up to Jerusalem anyways. He knows, and he's in control the Bible tells us elsewhere that they did not want to crucify him during Passover because all the people from all over the known world were gathered there. All the Jewish people were there. It would have been a big spectacle. They want to do this a little quietly over the side. Jesus, Jesus pushed the agenda, and he, he set it up so he would be crucified when there was this huge number of witnesses uh, to that moment in history. Jesus was not a helpless victim. He knew what he was doing, and he told the disciples, this is going to happen and I am going to rise from the dead three days later. <clears throat> and so they were, the apostles were deeply affected by this. Emotionally, they were, they were stunned, and, and they thought, no, our dear leader, we don't want this to happen to you. And so right away we see in the next paragraph that they get their mom, two of them get their mom to go and ask for high positions in the government he's going to set up. Okay, I was being facetious. They were not affected very much. And imagine you're Jesus. Now, when I sometimes say imagine you're the devil, admit it. That's easier. Uh, imagine you're Jesus, and you are the author of life. It wasn't that Jesus was eager or had a death wish. He loved life more than anybody. He's the author of it. And he's going to Jerusalem, and he knows he's going to have to suffer this. And it's not just the physical. More than that, in the entire, in the entire existence, the God, entire reality of the Trinity, we have God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and they're always in intimacy. They're always permanently linked together. And what Jesus is going to be do is he's going to have the sins of all time, the sins of all humanity dumped on him, and that's going to estrange him from the other two members of the Trinity. He's going to be separated. God is a relational God, and, he's, and this is sin, and what sin does is separate us in relationship. And he's going to face that. He's going through a hard time. He needs the relationship of his crew that he's worked with all this time, and they're not getting it. Not getting it. Have you ever been emotionally distraught and the people around you aren't getting it? It's hard, right? We all have real emotional needs. We have needs to be acknowledged, to be understood. Uh, when we're hurting, we, we want somebody to, to see that and to acknowledge that. And here Jesus is going up to this momentous point where he's going to be hammered and nailed to a cross. And he's not getting much uh, in the way of sympathy. He's not, he's, he's not getting much understanding of, at all. Let's look from uh, chapter 20, verse 20 now. <clears throat> then the mother of Zebedee, and you have to say it fast like that because it sounds cool. You don't want to say Zebedee. You want to say Zebedee. Uh, then the mother of Zebedee's sons uh, came to Jesus, that's James and John, came to Jesus with their sons, kneeling down and asked him a favor because they were such awesome men that they needed to get mommy uh, to come and ask them this. And what is it you want? He said, what would you like? He asked. She said, grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit on your right and the other at the left in your kingdom. In other words, they're asking for high positions of authority and they're still probably thinking that Jesus is going to establish a kingdom that's separate from the Roman Empire. More likely that's what they're thinking. And, uh, and so she, the mom comes and says, let my sons be big deals. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup I am about to drink? You don't know what you're asking. He just told them about 
the cross. He's going to suffer and die for the kingdom of God. And he says, you guys are asking to be part of that. You don't know what you're asking. Can you do what I'm about to do? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink from my cup. And we know that other than John, all the apostles died for their faith in Jesus Christ. And there's, there's an old saying that people die for a lie. If they really believe a lie, they'll die for it. But nobody wants to die for something they know is not true. These people were with Jesus. They saw Jesus crucified, and they n- met him and were taught by him after he rose from the grave. And they went everywhere. They lost uh, everything valuable to them. Eventually, they lost their lives telling people, God loves you. There is power in the name of Jesus. He rose from the dead, and you too can have eternal life. If you put your faith. They believed this to the point of death and they got nothing out of it from a human point of view. Uh, people will die for a lie. People die for lies all the time. But nobody is going to die for something they know is not true. But these men died for their faith. So Jesus said, you will indeed drink from my cup. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. Those places belong uh, to those for whom they have been prepared by my Father, uh, Father, Heavenly Father. When the ten heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. Isn't that cute? Uh, the ten, first, the two brothers were so immature. Jesus is talking about his death. They're not, much, they're not phased by that. They're not much affected by that. They, they still want to be great. So they go and talk to Jesus about this. He tells them, no, no, no. And then the other guys hear about this, and they are so upset and offended. Why? Because they're arrogant, and they're pro- full of pride. And, and so they hear about uh, what the two brothers did, and, and they were upset. So Jesus has to come up, call them together. Okay, guys. Come on, group huddle. Come on in, guys. Move in close. We have to talk. Listen to what Jesus Christ says. These are his apostles, the disciples that he's invested his life into, and he's almost, it's almost time for him to check out. They're not getting it yet. Jesus called them in together. He said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them. And their high officials exercise authority over them, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. What am I always saying? The greatest enemy from understanding this scripture is familiarity. You've heard this so many times. If you had heard this for the first time, it would have shocked you. A great man leads an army. A great man has lots of wealth. A great man has many servants. A great man has a big house. He's saying a great person is somebody who serves others in the kingdom. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man, just as I, Jesus is saying, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Wow. Wow. Greatness in the kingdom of God? Yeah, I don't know, Lord. Maybe mediocre is a better fit for me. You ever feel like that? Wow. Why did Jesus come? To serve? To give away his life? As a ransom for many people? And what do we often live for? Well, comfort, material things, prestige, ego stroke, a lot of things. This is, this is one of those messages higher than the messenger moments. Jesus says, be a servant. Serve others. You know, there's something about love and God is love, it can't be inward. You can't be just thinking about yourself all the time, how to take care of yourself. For one, that leads to misery, so you're not loving yourself anyways. It leads to disappointment. It leads to heartache. People that are wrapped up in themselves are always going to be complaining, always going to be miserable, always going to be unhappy. So it's self-defeating, right? Amen? Self-defeating. But when we can look outside of ourselves and look for needs to, to meet, See, look for ways to bless others. Look for ways to affirm one another and encourage one another and build each other up. Not only are we being used by God to be a blessing to others, we find that when we're more Christ-like ourselves, that we find 
more peace in our own souls. So we have to look outside of ourselves. But love is always going to be a painful situation. When you put your heart on the line to care and love for somebody, well, then what happens? Well, they can reject it. They can mistreat you. They can misunderstand your motives. They, they, can, uh, they can be very ungrateful. You can do a lot of things for people, and they turn around, and they, they just don't care. Love, by nature, is going to be painful, and Christ endured a lot of pain because he loves us. Christ endured the cross because he loves us. He's the same guy who says, pick up your cross, follow me. And now he's saying, guys, I'm going to drink this cup. You guys are going to drink from this too. If you want to be great in the kingdom of God, look for ways to serve others. If you, if you want to be like Jesus, we've got to look for ways to serve, not to be served, and be willing to give up. That's what I say. Hold lightly our stuff. Give up. in order to be a blessing and to show God's love for many people. Uh, here we see Christ is continuing his war on human pride. It's like a, a drumbeat. It's all throughout the book of Matthew. From the beginning, we've seen he's just, it, he's just getting after this. It's God taking a whooping stick and, and going after this, uh, this, this ego, this built, this, because it's human pride, it's human my will, my way, that ruins our relationship with God and ruins our relationship with our spouses, ruins our relationship between parents and children, ruins relationships within the church. My will, I've got to have my way. Getting offended easily, getting upset, all of this, God is saying, I'm going to get after that and I want to break that in you because it'll make you miserable. It'll ruin everything good. And if we can get this pride defeated, and if we can stop saying it's my stuff, my way, my and we can just let that go, God can do something incredibly beautiful as we become more Christ-like. This idea that broken people, broken people, uh, full of pride and, and arrogance, are estranging themselves, separating themselves from holy God is throughout the entire book of Matthew. Jesus came to die on the cross, and he came to deliver a message, to die on the cross because we're sinners, right, and separated from God, and to deliver a message. And he started off with this. The message, we've, what do we say about the Beatitudes? What do we say about the Sermon on the Mount? This is the message. It was, it was hinted at throughout all the Old Testament prophets, but this is the message that God waited to come in flesh to deliver, the most important sermon ever. And he, he starts it off with this broadside, like these old wooden ships. He turns the corner, just delivers the full broadside. He, he just hammers away at human pride. He says, blessed, lucky, is that the person who is broken in spirit. If you understand you're spiritually bankrupt, that's the first step to being uh, blessed. And so, and, and he just goes after it, and then the entire sermon on the mount, lucky is the person, blessed is the person who understands that we're spiritually broken. We're broken people. We do broken things. We have broken thought processes. Our emotions are broken. Our thoughts are broken. We need to humble ourselves before God and have ex not only accept his grace, but have grace for others because guess what? I'm broken and I might be wrong. Amen? When I say I might be wrong, you guys are quick to say amen. It goes both ways. Um, the reason for this is not just because uh, humble people are pleasant to be around, which they are, and, uh, and proud people are difficult and ungrateful. The stakes are, are much, much higher than that. So you sin, this sin, the pride sin, is what caused Satan to try and dethrone God. That's the sin where Satan said, I'm going to take that throne. I'm, I'm not going to let anybody call the shots in my life. I'm going to take that throne, make it my own, and that broke that relationship. He was an angel loved by God that broke the relationship, and he was banished from heaven in pride. If we don't humble ourselves, people, please listen. If I don't humble myself, say, Lord, please forgive me. I'm so, I'm so messed up inside. I need you. If we don't, that pride will get us banished from heaven too. And we'll have eternal separation from God. God is beauty and goodness. Look at the nature he created. And God is love and grace. And all good things come from God, flow out of his character, and eternal separation. You know what that's called? That's called hell. We don't want to go to hell, and we don't want anybody we love to go to hell. And what we need to do 
is humble ourselves and accept the love and grace that God is offering because pride brings separation. Pride will break relationships, ruin hope, ruin our peace, ruin our joy. Pride destroys everything good. When I'm filled up with selfish pride, I'm hard-headed, I'm ungrateful, I'm boastful, I'm, uh, I'm a miserable person to be around. Ask my wife. Better yet, don't ask her. <laughs> the disciples, still battling to be important, still wanted to be great, still, near the end of Jesus' ministry, he's been with them at least three years at this point. Uh, we don't know for sure when his ministry started or, 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 or all the details in there, but it's been at least three years because we can count the number of Passovers that are shown in Scripture. That doesn't mean there were Passovers that weren't recorded in Scripture, but if you count the number of Passovers, it looks like uh, Jesus Christ's public ministry is about three years at this point. He's been with his disciples pretty much that whole time. Time is running out. He's investing in these men. These men are going to change the world, start his church, and they're arguing who is greatest, and they're getting their mommy to come and say, uh, please give them high positions. How did that feel for Christ at that point? Must have been difficult. And we're going to see that whooping stick to pride. Christ is right after it up to, remember, the Last Supper. He washes their feet. Look at what I'm doing. Now do this to one another. And then after that, his prayer for the, for the believers. Before he went to the cross, my prayer is for unity. Set aside that pride, this, this stuff that divides. So I can remember when I was in high school, and I was a Christian before that, but my faith started to become really important to me. And the prayer that was most meaningful for me at that time, and I started bringing my Bible to church, to, well, Bible church, I started bringing it to school, to high school, to Parker, Parker High School, and sitting with it in the cafeteria and, and reading it and talking with people about Jesus, going to Bible studies before school and in, in, in some in the evenings. And, and uh, the prayer that just kept coming home to me again and again and again is, God, break my pride, God, break my pride, because I knew I would be unusable. And uh, now I still pray that, but I say, God, break my pride, but be gentle, because I'm older and wiser. Uh, when God breaks us, it's very painful, but we've got to trust that he's good, right? And uh, God, break our pride so that we can treat each other the way you want us to. There's a couple handy ways that uh, I've discovered over the years. Uh, one I heard from C.S. Lewis, and one I heard from a, a, another pastor in the Great Commission. There's a couple handy ways to test how... Uh, to what degree we are struggling with pride. The first way to check, do you have a servant's heart? Because Jesus said, you want to be great, you have a different servant's heart. The first way to check, do you have a servant's heart, uh, you need to ask yourself, how do you feel when people treat you like a servant? Yeah. This is scary. Yeah, maybe mediocre would be okay, God. You know, I don't know about great. Oh, that's, great is too much for me. <laughs> You can act humble even as if you're putting it off, right? How do you feel when people treat you like a servant? How dare they? What? How dare they treat one such as I? They do not know the majesty within my person. You know, I think we act like that. You ever see, you ever see two monkeys at the zoo and they bump into each other and you go, wah, like that? And then I, when I see human beings doing it, I think, oh, my, maybe that thing about, Chimpanzees and humans being 98% genetically the same, you know, some to that. Wow. It's, it's, uh, it's, not to our, it's nothing to be proud of, right? Let's not glory in our shame. How do we feel when people, we think, do a disservice to us or, or assume on us or, or treat us like servants? The second test to check our hearts and to ask ourselves how we, is to ask ourselves, how do we react when other people are acting arrogantly. Look at that guy. Loves the spotlight. What's wrong with her? She's always so full of herself. And, and we want to put people down because they're doing something. Do you simply shake your head and say, oh, man, yeah. 
brother, he's got a lot of admirable, qual admirable qualities. He's got to work on that area of pride. Straight up. No bitterness, no animosity. Oh, yeah, sometimes she's, she's a little arrogant. She can be rude to people. She's got to work on that. Just a simple acknowledgement in your mind. No animosity, n n nothing, no, 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 like, no seething in there. Or perhaps it maybe makes you sad because you think, oh, man, this person could be such a great servant for God. They could be so great in the kingdom if only they could set their pride down. Or, or maybe it even angers you because you say, look at, what are you doing to the people in the church? Look at you. You're mounting all over them because of your pride. And, and that bothers you because you've got this righteous indignation about it. Or, and you'd hate to see relationships hurt. You hate to see people's hearts wounded. Uh, you hate to see sin ruin a good man or a good woman. Or does another person's pride rile me up and I say to myself, who do you think you are? Or I say to myself, look at them just basking in the spotlight. Do, do I look down at them because of their pride? Do I devalue them? Do I, do I kind of laugh at them? Do I, do I start talking about them behind their backs? They look at, look at that person, look at that person. Do I, start to, do I allow myself to think uncharitable thoughts towards them? Guess what? I've got a pride issue when I do that. Here's the simple test. The more another person's pride offends or upsets us, the more likely it is that we struggle with the same sin of pride. A really humble person is not, is not broken over somebody else's pride. A really humble person says, oh, man, they got to work on that. But when I'm like, who do you think? That's because their pride just bumped into my pride. You get it? So these are two tests. Two, two different ways. How do people, how do I react when people treat me like a servant? And does other people's pride really get me going? Because if so, this is a good indication. Dan, you're still messed up. Proverbs 19.11 tells us, is the word of God, is it as a man's glory to overlook an offense? Well, I want to glory about the right. I don't want to. You know, you know what our world glory is about? Mess with me, you'll you got another thing coming. You mess with me, you will, you will not, you will regret that day. Well, fine, chimpanzee, you know. I didn't know better, right? It is a man's glory to overlook an offense. Let's deflate our prides a little bit. Take a pin to that balloon. In other words, a good man, in other words, a good man lets it go when he's offended. But an immature person holds on to every grievance, every slight, every time they've been overlooked. Let's set, or strive now to set aside our own pride while at the same time striving to be less offended when we sense pride in others. Let's strive to be servants of one another while at the same time not treating each other like servants. That's the neat thing in the church. Each one of us should have the idea, I'm going to be a servant to everybody else. And the rest of us, as we grow in Christ, we're going to be saying, you know what? I don't want to treat my brothers like a servant. I want to let them know I'm, I appreciate them. I want to affirm them. I want to let them know. And so, and so it's like everybody is here willing to be a servant, and now nobody else is wanting to take advantage of that. And by the way, it doesn't work because we're messed up. I mean, it, it works if we did it, but we're... The system is imperfect because we're imperfect. So that's why we need grace. And, and grace is what greases the wheels so we can st keep working on it because everybody in here, if you stick around long enough, is going to offend you at some point or another. And we've got to learn how to forgive one another. But the more we're becoming like Christ, the less easily we offended we are and the more we want to serve and bless one another. Amen? See, this is, this is message. It is It's hard. And, and I'm not going to stand up here and say, I got this. I, I got this. <laughs> no. But I don't want to settle for, settle for mediocre either, right? And this is beautiful. And Christ saying, listen, we know how it works in the Trinity. And I want you guys to get this too. And the more you get this, boy, your families are going to be wonderful places. Boy, your church is going to be a wonderful place. When God's people get this whole servant thing, and laying aside our pride and laying aside our right stuff, life becomes a lot better. I mean, you still have cancer and earthquakes and whatnot, and 
this is a fallen world. We're waiting for heaven, right? But life gets better when we start living out God's will right here, right now. The church needs to be a safe place for sinners to get healthy. Guess what? That's not just drug addiction and, and all the rest. Pride is a sin too, right? Let's have patience with one another when we struggle with that sin. Let's not cut each other out. Philippians 2.3 puts it this way, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important, or maybe translation says as better than yourselves. So if you're being a servant and everybody else is saying, well, I'm not better than everybody else, we're not going to take advantage of one another, are we? God's economy is based upon the things God values. God values a servant's heart. The world's economy is based upon what fallen humanity on a highway to hell values. God values love. God values forgiveness. God values patience and not giving up on one another. Fallen humanity values, God values servants, people being servants. Fallen humanity values people being servants for us. So does our religion serve ourselves, or does our religion serve others? Paul wrote to Timothy about this in the second letter to the young preacher. But mark this, he's saying, there will be terrible times in the last days. And uh, we're seven days closer to the last days than we were last Sunday when we met together. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people. And later in the same paragraph, uh, Paul says, but Paul called upon Timothy to be humble, to be godly, to be different than the world. He wrote, you, however, you, however, know all about my teaching. So don't be like that. You know all about my teaching. You know about my way of life, my purpose, my faith, patience, love, endurance, persecutions, sufferings, what kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, the persecutions I endured. See, when you love, you're going to get hurt. Yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Jesus Christ will be, does anybody know what the next word is? Persecuted. That's right. While evildoers and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived, but for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you have learned it, and you know how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. All Scripture, all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. We're here and we're studying, and sometimes we're rebuked. I was trying to put the word rebuke and correct together. It doesn't work. Sometimes we're rebuked, sometimes we're corrected. And the point is not just so we can come to church and get a little happiness dose in the arm for a week. We're being equipped to be servants of God who are going to start doing good deeds and, do, and advancing God's kingdom in our lives and blessing the people around us. We're being equipped to do what God wants us to do, even if he calls us to some hard, difficult places. Only servants are great in God's eyes. Greatness in the kingdom of God, or I don't know, Lord, maybe mediocre is a better fit for me. Uh, we're fallen, we're broken, and God has called us to something noble and beautiful. And let's answer that call and strive for the rest of our lives uh, in grace to live the kind of lives that God would have us. Let's pray. Lord God, here we are. Uh, once again, we, we want to surrender to you, and this is something we've got to do daily throughout the day. Lord, we once again want to verbalize, we want to acknowledge God your ways are higher than our ways. And Lord, we want to be here to serve you and to serve your children, to serve the lost, Lord, and not just to 
serve ourselves. Lord, please save us from ourselves. Save us from the value systems of this messed up world. Save us from the enemy who tried to take your place, Lord. And Father, help us to be instruments of your love. We want to be loving. We want to be good. We want to hear that noble call and answer it, Lord. Thank you, Father, just for letting us have this Bible, letting us read these words from our Savior, Jesus Christ, 2,000 years later. They're so totally different than anything in our world. They can still rock our lives, Lord, and we thank you for that. Pray this in your name, Father. Amen. Thank you for watching Foundation TV. Foundation TV is a ministry of Foundation Bible Church, Janesville, Wisconsin. Find us online at foundationbiblechurch.com. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.